Baxi's musical podcast. The town of Cohasset is a small coastal community on the south shore of Massachusetts, approximately about an hour away from where I grew up as a kid and about 27 miles out of Boston. It might not exactly be the place where one might expect great rock bands to pop up in the late 1960s, but it was. And among them was the band Colacus, a band that started at Cohasset High School in 1968. At the time, the band would originally call themselves the Emergency Exit, then the Criminals, And in spite of winning a battle of the bands and gaining a quick following, the members of the band split off and went to college. George Habistro went to the University of Massachusetts. Mark Sisson went to Massasoit State College. And Lincoln Bloomfield went to Harvard. Four years later, they got the band back together along with drummer Carl Kennedy and renamed themselves Kalakas to honor Habistro's Greek family heritage. By 1975, Kalakas began playing throughout Boston and New York City, through upstate New York, and throughout the rest of New England. And by 1978, the band would release their first album called Gone of the Days. And while the album was receiving some pretty positive reviews, the band would soon split up, with each of the members going off in their separate ways. It's not exactly an unusual rock story, but what is unusual is that 37 years later, those tapes from the original studio album were found, remastered, and re-released under the title Colacus on Court, rare tracks from a vintage 70s band. That album of remastered songs generated praise that the original album never quite received, but they were then called the best Boston band you've never heard of. Fast forward eight years later, all four of the original members of Colacus have returned to release their first album in 45 years, hurtling towards extinction. The album is every bit as interesting as the four men who put it together, and that includes my guest today, bass player Lincoln Bloomfield, who not only produced and mixed the new album, he also happens to be a diplomat who spent the last 40 years working in Washington under three U.S. presidents as an assistant secretary of state, handling foreign policy and issues of national security. It's not exactly the sort of career path you might expect from the bass player of a South Shore rock band, but then again, Lincoln Bloomfield isn't your typical diplomat either. This is my conversation with Ambassador Lincoln Bloomfield from Colacus on Baxi's Musical Podcast. Yeah, Michael. Hey, Lincoln. How are you? Hey, thanks for doing this. Oh my gosh, I'm I'm thrilled to do it. First of all, it's uh, it's so good to talk to someone from the South Shore. <laughs> <laughs> are you from the South Shore? Yeah, I I grew up well about an hour away from Cohasset. I grew up in Rehoboth, which is near. Taunton and Attleboro, that that area, not not right. too not too far from where uh, you grew up. Oh, that's great. Yeah, my sister lives in Andover. My older sister, and yeah, so a lot of lot of Massachusetts connections. <laughs> nice to talk to someone who's uh, who's breathed in the same air. So I got the uh, the CD, had a chance to listen to it. I really like it. It's an, an amazing story about Colacus, and uh, and not just the fact that uh, you're releasing your first material in over forty years. I mean, this is a band that that kind of got rediscovered in a way after a long period of time. Tell me a little bit about that. So, uh, you know, the short history is three of us, uh, George George Habistro with the Kalakas family, uh, Mark Sisson and I uh, all got together in Cohasset. George and I grew up together. Um, and we, when Mark arrived from Seattle in about ninth or 10th grade, he brought a guitar and suddenly there were three bands and there were dances and battle of the bands and, you know, the Cohasset Common festivals. It was great, um, and we and we thought we had something. This was right in the late '60s. You you know what was happening. If you just look at a top 30 list, you can't believe the <laughs> mishmash of everything from Aretha Franklin to the Beatles to MacArthur's Park and everything in between. It's amazing, and that's what we were listening to. Jimi Hendrix experience. So we kept going, uh, kept going uh, through college, off and on. Uh, went through a lot of drummers. Uh, and then when we met Carl Kennedy, who came from upstate New York, Elmira, Ithaca, uh, we renamed the band Colacus in 1975, played a lot of dues uh, for a few years. I mean, hundreds of gigs right. in New Jersey, New York, upstate, Pennsylvania, Boston. And then uh, after the album came out in 1978, Gone Are the Days, uh, we promoted it and then we went our separate ways. I went to um, graduate school in Boston at Fletcher. 
uh, came to Washington um, and went in years in the government yeah. and sort of put everything <laughs> behind me. And then I got back into it because a bunch of diplomats um, wanted to perform a band, and I was I was just not going to do it, except they dragged in Skunk Baxter of Steely Dan and the Doobie Brothers, who's a <laughs> consultant to the intelligence community. And when he said he was in the band, and he, you know, when I'm in, I'm in, you know, I, you don't say no. So <laughs> we started doing charity concerts about once a year. It caused quite a stir in Washington. There's, there's a lot of music going on now in government, among government people. So that's fun. We're still doing it about once a year. Secretary of State Tony Blinken plays with our band. <laughs> so it's, it's great. Um, and then, you know, Carl Kennedy found the tapes from our first album. And they were two-inch Ampex studio tapes. We had them run raw onto digital. I was, uh, I always liked recording. So now by then, you know, Skunk Baxter had urged me to get a Pro Tool studio, get a real rig so i taught myself how to do pro tools and um and got a lot of plugins and a lot of effects and a lot of this and that and so remixed the first album and it came out as a cd in 2015 Colacus uncorked like a fine bottle of wine rare rare tracks from a vintage 70s band and our great publicist chip ruggieri uh, shopped it around to the, the critics and some of them were very nice to us they they said wow you you know, Kalakis, a great Boston band. They should have been, they should have made it, you know, et cetera. So that got to our head yeah. and we said, you know, <laughs> let's try, let's, let's try some music. And uh, the first cut is on this album. It's called Florida Flash Flood. It's like a volcano going off. You know, if you think that 40 years is going to slow these guys down, listen to Florida Flash Flood. We couldn't keep up with George. I mean, uh, just <laughs> unbelievable uh, power and energy and ferocity. You know, talking about, uh, what happens in Florida <laughs> when <laughs> when the rains hit, um, and then we just kept going and going, and the result is a twelve song album, and uh, we're we're really happy with it. So let me go back a little bit. I mean, you talk about you getting kind of back together and and really hunkering down after you all graduate from college. I mean, I do believe George went to UMass and uh, you went to Harvard, but you know when you guys got out of school and you started to really kind of focus in on the band. First of all, tell me what was going on in the Boston area at the time. I mean, when I think of bands that came out of Boston in 73, 74, 75, you're talking about, you know, major artists that came in and out of that city. What was going on when you guys were getting back together as Kalakas? Well, um, we, first of all, we were called the criminals before we met Carl. We had, uh, we were working through a, a booking agent in Boston, Lordly and Dame. And they were putting us in colleges and in some clubs, you know, Kenmore Square, Harvard Square, Charlie's Place. And, and those were going well. We were, but we didn't have the same kind of pull that, you know, Jay Giles or uh, The Cars or Boston, you know, one of my favorite bands of all time. You know, th those guys really were great and they, they deserved everything they got. They got a lot of attention. Aerosmith. I remember we played a club in Revere once. Uh, during the week, and the weekend act was going to be Aerosmith, just sort of while they were making it. They hadn't quite made it yet. Uh, so we were we were seeing the footsteps of these great musicians, these great bands. Didn't quite connect. After we met Carl, we moved into a, an old farmhouse. In fact, it's called the Old Farmhouse. It's one of the oldest houses in Kingston, Mass. Mm -hmm. So that's a little further south, right right behind Plymouth. And that's where we rehearsed, and we'd go down to the Cape and play a few gigs there, and then you know, around the South Shore into Boston. Uh, and then we decided to move to Metro New York to try to find, you know, a bigger market. But but while we were there, uh, we, we went over to Plymouth one day before we had any gigs and we posed in front of the Mayflower on a windy day. And I always thought that picture, in fact, I lost that photo. When I found that the band said, you know, there's something about that picture. So we gave it to our graphic artist in Belgium, Eric Philippe. And it's, you see it on the CD on the back cover. That's before we ever played a single gig. And it's kind of an iconic picture. I'm looking at it right now. It is, it's a great picture of the four of you. But uh, it's a better choice to do the Mayflower than, say, Plymouth Rock, which is maybe one of the most embarrassing tourist trap destinations in the state. But So, so, the, so you guys, uh, you, you get back and you record that first album. How long did the band fall apart after the release of that record? Well, I was sort of in a rush because we spent 13 days and nights uh, mixing it. And if, it was just a, a panic. And I got to throw out a couple of names. Alex Perialis, uh, his dad owned Pyramid Sound. He's a great musician, musical engineer. 
you know, Ithaca College. You can look him up. He's, he's a pretty big name now in recording. And, and there was a 16-year-old kid behind him uh, from Dryden, New York, who was quiet and helped out a lot and ended up doing a lot of the engineering. His name was Tony Vallant. Tony Vallant is one of the most respected audio engineers in the world. I mean, he did Steely Dan, Asia, Neil Young's live album. Uh, and he's doing movie post-production right now. Uh, so we had some really talented people working with us. And so uh, I went to graduate school after we finished mixing the album. And right. we had very talented young guys who went on to become famous audio engineers. And then the band promoted the record as the band broke up, I guess. George came to Massachusetts. He was playing locally, uh, acoustic guitar and in clubs and whatnot. And then uh, I went to Washington. I came up uh, where we did some studio gigs at uh, Soundtrack Studios in Boston, right near what used to be Boston Garden. I guess it's uh, T TD Garden. TD, TD Garden now. Whatever yeah. it is. Um, or the Celtics play. Right. And um, Tony Vallant was the resident lead engineer. He had, he had worked with us in Ithaca. Uh, and he played drums. And so we did some records there. One of them... We redid for this album, I, such a good song, uh, Downhill Slide. And um, so that is on the new album. But George wrote that in the 80s, and we originally recorded that uh, in Boston. Um, and then uh, I guess George and I stayed in touch. He was privately recording and writing a lot of music. I was not doing as much, but I had some, some songs that I really wanted to record. Like one of them from back then is called uh, The Lone Road. That's the third song on the album. I wrote it on acoustic guitar, so I'm pretty happy about that. When you come back, you know, with the with the original members of the band, and you know, and there's lots of time in between your last album and now, what is it like to play with these guys again? It, it, it must be so much fun, and so many memories must be uh, pouring out of this situation. What what must it like be like to to be back with these guys? Well, it, the spirits are very high, and the one thing I would say is what the drummer Carl Kennedy said right away, he said, we played so many gigs together. We paid so many dues that we can finish each other's musical thoughts. So <laughs> it's like, there was never any question, how do I play this song? It's as soon as you hear something I wrote or George wrote or uh, Mark wrote a song, we just know how to play it. It was just, we just knew because yeah. it was our DNA. Yeah. So that was the main thing. We just knew. We just knew. Yeah, I've heard that before from other bands that, you know, take some time and get back together where it's like this, it's this muscle memory thing. Like you just, you don't forget the songs. You don't forget your parts, even though you may not have heard the songs in, you know, 20, 25 years. It just, like you say, it's, it's a part of your, of your DNA. You never quite, <laughs> you never quite let that go. That's true. And one, you know, one reason we never had managers and we didn't follow the, if you listen to the Beatles, you can't tell me two songs that sound the same, right? right. But by the seventies, if you were a new band, they would say, well, you got to go in the studio, same equipment, same, you know, instruments, play eight songs in a row. Uh, if you go to Spotify or, you know, there's 50 different <laughs> categories. They didn't have any categories when we started. And uh, that's sort of the way we think about music. So instead of going easy uh, i wanted as i produced this i wanted to bring the personality of the band out i wanted you to hear those drums including the kind of the noise between the hi-hat and the snare i want you to hear that kick drum thumping your chest with the bass guitar i want you to hear you know george's licks with all the personality and the vocals yeah. uh, we didn't shave off the edges or anything we wanted to you know really put our fingerprint out there and uh, some people it won't be their cup of tea but if the people who like it you know it It'll be a strong cup of tea. It sounds terrific. I mean, you did, you did a really good job mixing and producing it. I mean, the, just the just the drum sounds alone, I think, are really sensational on this record. Well, I appreciate it. I mean, I can't tell you how much Carl beat me up over and over <laughs> again. He's done, he's done on 45 albums. And, you know, boy, did we go over the drum sound until, until I really feel like now I know I know a lot about drum sounds. I'm pretty good at <laughs> kick drum, for example, which is hard. Yeah. And snare, you know, has to be just right. So and and so, but we also had a great mastering engineer, a guy named Blaine Misner at Q Studios. He is a gem. He's he's really super qualified. He should be famous. We're trying to brag about him, but Blaine was always the guy that would come back and forth to me and say, "I got too much EQ on the cymbals and the." I got to, the vocals are too mouthy and he, he was really helpful to me. So we would do it over and over again until everybody said, yeah, it's good. That's the one. Yeah. So you, you mentioned it before and it's a fascinating part of your career. You know, once the band broke up, 
you took a, a path that, that most musicians don't typically take. You get a job in Washington with the, with the Pentagon, and you, know, you start working with under many uh, administrations. It's almost the least rock and roll career pathway I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. No, no one's going to accuse me of being a rock and roll guy, uh, except uh, I like to write songs. I like to record. I like to play music with my friends and um, I love music. And so I'm guilty of loving music, just like all your listeners. Um, I look up to the real rock stars of the world. And frankly, you know, I got to look at my bandmates with a lot of awe. I mean, George Haberstro, you take note of that name. One of the real motivations that I, for me to do this record was the world needs to know who George Haberstro is. Yeah. He's a great singer and he's a great lead guitarist. And, you know, now he's got, we got 27 songs over 47 years. He deserves the legacy that he's starting to get now. And I'm proud of him. And of course, Carl Kennedy is, is well known. He's a, in the metal world. Uh, I mean, he's got a band, The Rods. They're going to Australia next year uh, with a metal tour. Very prominent. And Mark Sisson is a great musician, too. Yeah. All, all of them. Well, let's talk a little bit about your career in, in, in Washington. I believe your father was uh, a political scientist, and so obviously growing up in that environment probably set you on a path a little bit to get involved in the, in the family business. But tell me a little bit about that, and, and what was your interest when you were young into, into politics and, and foreign policy? Well, you know, not to go too deep into it, but I was born into it. My, my father's father, who I never knew, died in the late 1930s. Um, new five presidents. I've got all of his his writings and his letters, which will be put into the Boston um, Genealogical Society next year. Mm. Uh, my mother was a diplomat from New Zealand, one of five girls. They didn't have a son, but her dad was a big politician. Came home from World War One, ran for parliament in New Zealand, and became the youngest native son ever elected prime minister of New Zealand. So, and he was finance minister, and then he died in '43 as the defense. Minister of Defense Coordination. So he's a very, you know, Gordon Coates in New Zealand is a big name. So, uh, so I was born with people who lived and breathed world events, war and peace, foreign policy. That was my life. And I just knew I had an obligation to try to get close to where decisions are made and the nuclear war. That was the number one issue. And yeah. then while I was in Washington, the Soviet Union ended and uh, the world changed. And, and now we have a whole bunch of different dangers, which I'm very actively following. I go on Arab television sometimes twice a day mm. to talk about the Gaza crisis and issues with Iran and, and other things. Yeah, I, I do want to touch on that a little bit, but uh, but it, it seems to me that throughout your professional career in, in, in foreign policy, I mean, you've been kind of in the middle of some very delicate parts of our history, at least of which would be 9-11. I mean, this is a moment where we as Americans take on a very different view of the world, but also begin to take another look at our own government and how it operates to be involved in in crisis situations globally whatever they may be tell me about the challenge of of that because none of these things are resolved with simple solutions these are all very complicated events and complicated you know conversations that you have to have that you, you don't divide you want to have people on the same page, and it seems to be in Washington, that's very, very hard to do. Boy, I couldn't agree with you more, Michael. It is harder than ever. What's happened is, is a problem, and part of it has been fueled by people overseas using the Internet and platforms to divide us. Some of this is coming from offshore. You know, I remember growing up in the Boston area, and so do you. I still feel like I come from the people who threw the tea into, <laughs> into the harbor, you know. We, we're a free country. And and I feel that even today. So that's my attitude. And people from Boston, I think, are like that. Um, I don't judge. I don't want to know anybody's politics before I talk to them. I just sure. don't. Um, the, the problem today with, the, with so much media is, okay, something big happens in the world. You need to understand what, what's the impact on people far away. I mean, what are they going through? You really need to think about that. Then when you're dealing with bad guys, and I'm talking about Vladimir Putin or the clerics who run Iran and are being so bad to the women and taking all the money for all the wrong, you know, committing terrorism. You look at those people, you really have to study them. Like, what do they, what do, they do when they get up in the morning? What are they thinking? Because if you can't anticipate them, it's like pro football. If yeah. you're not gaming the other side, you're never going to be effective. 
But then you turn around and say, look, we're representing 330 million Americans, their values and the future of the country, their kids. So, you know, are we doing the right thing? And I, I, t I list all those questions. It doesn't mean we get it right. And we've made bad mistakes. Is They own up to their mistakes. I've gone to a lot of sessions with four star generals where they admit they screwed up yeah. and they talk about it with the four stars, the three stars. And, and you know, and they they try to figure out what do we what can we do better? So you need to do that. If, if you want to excel, you, you know, you have to keep asking, are we doing the right thing? And it's hard. I admit it's really hard. Well, I mean, when you look at situations like, you know, the, the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine or the tensions in Israel or even, you know, the, the tensions between U.S. and China, you know, I, I think most Americans have this oversimplistic view of how to resolve these things. And if they were that simple, we would have resolved them years ago, you know, especially the, in particular, Israel and Hamas. I mean, I know that some people are saying, you know, they're, they're, they're pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. You know, but the fact of the matter is these are incredible incredibly complicated situations that have been unresolved for thousands and thousands of years. My question to you is, are these things fixable with diplomacy or alone, or have we in some way missed out on that opportunity? Well, you've gotten me into some ha ha deep water here in the pool, but <laughs> I, to the Middle East people, I'll say two things. One, um, everyone wants to debate. Like, I was right. They were wrong. They, they, they did something bad first, so we're not guilty. It's not a debate. You know, there's no blue ribbon that someone's going to get at the end of this. It's a puzzle. How do these people end up living together so their children aren't killing each other? That's a different question. Yeah. And it's really hard. Second thing I'll say is I can look out my window. Michael, you can look out your window. Imagine just for a moment you see hang gliders coming over the top of the roof line with motorcycles with machine guns on them. And these guys just started throwing flash grenades and firing away at you and your kids and your neighbors without warning. That's what happened on October 7th in Israel. And by the way, and I won't go deep, but you know they didn't <laughs> invade the occupied terrorist 65 countries called Israel. Palestinians were victims, and I have real problems with you know them, what's happening in Gaza. So I'm not trying to take sides here. I am saying uh, the big answer that you're looking for is diplomacy, of course. You've got to get, all that means is you talk to people, you tell them things, you have ideas. You say, let's do this, let's do that. But you have to have muscle behind it. I mean, if they think, why am I talking to him? No. If the United States stands strong, if we, if we support our government, even though we're divided, let them go out and try to solve this, put some muscle behind it, respect our great military if they have to do something. It doesn't all have to be military. It could be humanitarian aid. It could be a conference that brings everyone together. Uh, but we got to do something to stop this. All the bad guys are, are, are getting worse in the world, and we need to step it up. I mean, I, I didn't mean to make this about a, you know, a real hell, a real deep you know, political discussion, but you know, to me it's just really fascinating that this is, <laughs> this is what you do. I mean, I don't, uh, you don't always get, uh, you don't always get someone of your, of your pedigree involved in a conversation, even, even though we started off with music, and we'll go back to it in a little bit. But one of the things I just find so interesting is, uh, like, for example, you know, Henry Kissinger died recently. It's a very polarizing individual. There's some people who say he did great things, and there's some people who said he did horrific things. As a diplomat yourself, and you, and you look at the career of, of this man, are, are we confused about what Henry Kissinger was all about? Are, we, are there some people that are just seeing it wrong or not looking at the totality of what he accomplished or did not accomplish? During his career, because it's I mean, it's a very complex legacy that uh, that he dies with. Well, of course, I'm not going to try to put my thumb on the scale <laughs> on you know, the life and career of Henry Kissinger. There's a Niall Ferguson has written the first of a two part giant biography of his life. I haven't gotten very far through it. But, you know, for people who are interested, here's what I'll say. He was a professor before he came to Washington. And my dad was a professor, and I've got a bunch of letters. Uh, they, you know, Brzezinski was a professor at Columbia. All these professors knew each other really well. During the early 60s, when the nuclear threat was emerging, they were trying to figure out how to stop nuclear war, including Kissinger. Um, so I have a bunch of letters. I put one on LinkedIn the other day from Kissinger to my dad when he was Secretary of State, um, just to show that these guys dictated their mail, and they, they, they really did listen to each other about problems in the world. Um, He's going to be judged on Vietnam, Cambodia. He's going to be judged on 
a Middle East piece, whether he was favoring one side or the other, he's going to be judged on you know, India, Pakistan. Sure, you will look at him as a, a very influential guy. The one thing, uh, anybody in college listening to this, he was, his reading list at Harvard was something like 30 pages long. It was the scariest reading list I've ever seen. I, I still have a copy of it upstairs. I mean, this man read everything and he traveled the world and talked to world leaders, even as a professor. That's what he did. And he did it uh, like, like Bill Gates read, writing code. Henry Kissinger was all about foreign policy. To go back to, uh, to the band here a little bit, when you talked about you know, playing with, uh, you know, with, uh, with Jeff Baxter, and, uh, and I remember having interviewed him many years ago. I think it was like not too far after September 11th. Here's a guy who has become like one of these in- incredible experts in, in weapon systems. And anyone who was ever a fan of the Doobie Brothers or, or Steely Dan has a hard time compartmentalizing that and understanding that he really was and still continues to be an incredibly brilliant guy when it comes to this topic. And it, it isn't just about are you reeling in the years? It's 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 about. I mean, this is this is a really a really fascinating guy. He is, but here's what I'll say about Skunk. From what I know, he's a he's a good guy. He's a dear friend. He's a real patriot. I mean, 9-11, I remember him telling me, you know, they're cutting people's fingers off. That's what he said about the Taliban. Now, this is one of the greatest guitar players of his generation. Right. Um, and, you know, that really got to him. So to give you an idea, he's friends with Dan Aykroyd. And there was a time when um, the threat in Los Angeles against the police force, uh, they were using bullets that were penetrating their, their armor. And they didn't have money for, uh, you know, for heavier vests. And Dan Aykroyd, you know wrote a check and skunk baxter they've done a lot of charities together i i actually played guitar because skunk wanted me to play bass but then and they got somebody else so he said bring a guitar i'm not a great guitarist but i was on stage uh to help to benefit the families of cia officers who've died in in in, du- on, in duty on duty and Aykroyd came you know it was really a, baxter is not out to kill people he is a really great techie if you look at all the rolling pedals that guitar players use um i asked him how many do you own he said none (laughs) they're all borrowed (laughs) you know he doesn't want to pay taxes on them uh but this guy has the fender the fender custom shop you know has baked in all these computer programs into his custom into his fender guitars and we once played a club in new york where he just he was playing keyboard on guitar he was doing like (laughs) calliope and you know skating rink organ and because we were playing old 60s tunes and uh i mean it was he just showing off but He's really a good man. He has run the, the the red team on some of these war games where his job is to mess with the Americans and make life as miserable as possible. He's re- really good at that. So Jeff is just a super smart guy who cares a lot about his country, and he's not, uh, you know, a militarist at all. Yeah, he's someone who's really trying to help figure out how do we say, how do we protect ourselves against the worst people in the world. And I, God bless him. Yeah. So with the album out and, uh, you know, again, it's been a lot of years between, you know, album one and album and album two. I mean, are you guys looking to, to continue on as a band? Are you looking to, you know, maybe get on the road with these songs? What, what's, what's the plan moving forward with Kalakas? So, uh, we, we have very quickly come to, a, a band and rule, which is never say never because <laughs> people are asking, are you guys going to play? Um, uh, we've been asked to play. That would be a surprise. Um, so was this album. But I would just say this. We came from the time, and you, you I don't know if you were old enough, Michael, but you know, when, when all this music was happening in the late 60s, we, we had giant stereo speakers. We had great headphones. We listened in the dark. You know, it was about listening. Sure. We'd go down to the beach in Cohasset, and you know, Led <laughs> Zeppelin playing you know, on the radio, cranked up. And, and watching, it's not as audio as it used to be. They like to watch something. And so we've done two videos, um, and those were the pre-release songs. And uh, I'm happy to say that over 90,000 people have watched these two videos. So we're working on the third. Uh, we'll be doing more of those. Um, but just listen. And because our goal in life was to just have that music out there. Because yeah. there's, there's so many good musicians out there. And, and you know, Spotify uploads 100,000 tracks a day. So you can imagine how many musicians never never get their music out there. And we're just trying to give it 
send that kite as flat as high up in the sky as we can. Uh, I'll be in London this week talking to the magazines <laughs> there, and uh, we're just trying to get the music out there so people can hear it. Well, I mean, Lincoln, it's a real pleasure to talk to you, and I, I wish you best best of luck. I hope there's more from Kalakas down the road. It's it's a it's a really great record. You should all all four of you should be incredibly proud of it. Michael, you're a great guy to do this. Thank you. And I'm also pleased that when I talk to a Massachusetts guy, he knows a lot. See, that that's true of our album. Our album is about how we're doing in the world, and, and we should care about it. So thank you for the time. It's an honor. And to all your listeners, hi to everyone from Massachusetts. Sorry about the Patriots. There's nothing that can be said about that. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Lincoln, have, have a great day. We appreciate the time today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike. You take care. You all the best to you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye now. The name of the new Kalakas album is called Hurtling Towards Extinction. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to like it, share it, review it, tell all your friends about it. Feel free to follow on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok for regular updates. You can also email me at Bax at rock102.com. I'd love to hear what you think. Thanks again for listening to Baxi's Musical Podcast.